All right, we are live here. This is Greg from Pixel Fondue. I am here with Michael McCarthy from uh, Foundry and Rich Hurry from Kite String. And there's Rich, chilling. What's your shirt say, Rich? It says, uh, "Let's handle this by like adults. Paper, scissors, rock." Oh, there you go. There you go. No, I do rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, see that you and my kids will get along. That's right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I go rock, paper, scissors, too. I don't think I've ever heard paper, scissors, rock. But all right. First time. I always throw paper, though. You always you always throw paper? Thanks for letting us know. No matter what. <laughs> Even if you know, it's still it's still going to work. You just gave no. us away. OK, so we got chat going here. I see Nigel saying it's alive. OK, so um, people in chat. Uh, uh, feel free to throw out questions. I'll keep an eye on the chat window. This uh, particular live stream will be covering Moto 13.2 betas, rigging and animation features. Uh, Moto 13.2 beta is out right now. So if you're a maintenance or a subscriber, you can um, download it and mess around with these today and uh, get on the uh, uh, forum over at Foundry and talk about any bugs you find or any features you'd like to see improved. Things like that. Um, uh, Michael, are you any thoughts on is this? We we're in the early stages of beta here, right? This would be a little bit before this comes out. Uh, yeah, a little bit. I think we're we're we a couple of a couple betas in. Um, I think we'll be RC zero in a couple of weeks or something of that nature. Um, so yeah, we'd really like to have people come in and you know uh, chat us up about the features, uh, find some bugs so we can squish them dead, and um, you know get on there and get active. That would be awesome. Nice. Okay. And Rich, we're going to talk a little bit about Kite String today as well. Kite String launched, what, about a month ago? Yeah, September 12th, I believe, is when it went live. Um, the beta, early beta deadline was supposed to be uh, um, a month from there. Um, but we decided, sorry, I guess it was October, or August 12th. My gosh, time flies. So we pushed it to October 1st, and then we had people going, please, I need a little more time. So today is actually the last day that you can get the kite string early beta discount. So, the actual drop dead. No, yeah, today, end of day today. So a little extra, a little extra time. That was nice to have. Well, it's it's uh, you know it it is an investment, but it's it's got so much in there for people that want to learn rigging and how to think about rigging, uh, and you get all these great rigs. And I keep changing it. I mean, what we're going to show today is I've redone the lip rig for the sample character that's in um, RMC3. And that's now that there are new features and I've been able to optimize it and make it better, that flows in. So everybody that's a KiteString member doesn't just get what I delivered at the time of the start. They get all the new stuff. So as I'm coming up with new ideas and solving new problems and getting input from people, all of these assets are also updating and upgrading. So it's cool because in a way, I'm master rigging for people that are part of the kite string community, and it's fun. I mean, we've had a couple of breakout sessions where we're sitting and talking about rigging and getting advice. We did this little rig doodle. Uh, one of the guys, Jorge, had this landing gear example that he was trying to solve, and we just worked it out together. It's it's cool. It's a lot of fun. So it's more than just, hey, get a bunch of static training. It, it's alive, a and it's, it's a community. Yeah, fun that interactive part of it, I think, is really cool. And, uh, yeah, I had the pleasure of going up there and checking it out, and it's awesome. You guys could. Take a look, should take a look. Awesome. Thanks, man. Cool. Uh, all right. So we got that going. And then, you know, Rich is also um, putting some of these kite string features he's talking about, little videos on Pixel Fondue, so you can kind of see how this in depth training works. So, um, in terms of training, and just looking at the chat over here, uh, Pixel Fondue is really geared towards uh, free training. It's very scattershot. Uh, there's a number of us who put up videos on uh, anything from the Vaughn and 60 Second series to, you know, stuff I do or, or Richard Yacht or some of the other contributors over here. Um, where Kaistring is obviously more like a masterclass focused uh, series of videos. They're going to be interconnected. You've got some um, very experienced industry people like Rich and, and, and some others uh, creating those. And it's going to you know, cover multiple packages as well, eventually. Um, yeah. Plus, there's an asset aspect to Kaistring where um, you're going to be getting a vast number of, I don't know, how many files does like just your mouth rig have, Rich? Or the face rig? Um, the face rig, is there's 90. Um, 90, 90, 90, 90, yeah, nine zero. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So <laughs> when I was going through figuring it out and built, cause you know, when I left Pixar, I was like, all right, I'm going to build the kind of face rig I want to work with. And I'm going to use Moto as my canvas. And we're going to build this as I was going, I kept going, all right, I need this little helper and I need this little tool. And so as I went through, I created these assemblies that are useful tools that I needed and everybody else can share. Them. So maybe part of it. All right, cool. Yeah. 
I was actually just up on uh, Pixel Fondue 2 and some of the stuff from, uh, is it Richard Yacht? Uh, it was really cool. That's new. Um, you know, very pretty recent stuff, too. Uh, that's that's great stuff. Yeah, as well. He's great. He's super yeah. Great. Yeah. Richard just released uh, a bunch of new mesh ops that he put together. Um, some really useful stuff. And of course, he has a ton of uh, great training as well. Um, and OK, so I don't know. Let's just jump into the animation features. There's been a sort of a push in animation for 13 series. Um, the initial one was a lot of performance and um, now we're getting into 13.2 is showing, if you haven't looked at the beta yet, there's a handful of features we're going to look at today. One, there's new IK, which is um, a pretty big feature. And yeah. and so there's some IK and some some features around the new IK. Uh, there's also something called, well, there's a graph editor. There's some improvements to the graph editor, which will show some really, uh, really nice um, workflow improvements and just sort of user interface improvements to the graph editor, which I'll go through really quickly. One of the things we'll try to do with this live stream, instead of just chatting, everybody keeps complaining as we don't show the features we're actually talking about. And that's part of that has just been an issue with um, live streaming and just, you know, the Moto interface not looking very good in the live stream and working with beta software and things like that. But we're just going to go for it today and, and show it. Go and for it. Uh, and this is being recorded um, at a really high resolution and will be put up later. So anything that looks blurry in the live stream due to bandwidth issues should look fine as this is uh, if you're watching this right now in a non-live situation later on. So um, the really cool thing about um, 13.2 is something called gradients. And so gradients can be accessed via of a schematic or in a layers type system, uh, like many things in Moto, uh, gradients are uh, nodes and layers are ways to manipulate the existing gradients in Moto. So we all have seen gradients in Moto as a little value graph that can be used for modeling or particle systems or fall offs now uh, for animation. So they're, they're all scattered throughout Moto and now there's ways to manipulate those procedurally, which is, is really awesome. So we're gonna show a fair amount of stuff on that as well. Um, and I think we maybe we'll just jump into, um, I don't know, Michael, do you want to have to say anything else about 13.2 release before we jump in and start showing some of this stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say we, I was super excited to work with uh, all the animation features. Uh, I think we pushed out some, uh, well, we're pushing out some amazing stuff here. And uh, yeah, uh, as you said, Greg, bringing the, the kind of performance improvements and then, you know, looking at taking those into the graph editor or a brand new IK system. Um, those are just mega improvements and we're super excited for them. Um, you know, the, the things with the gradients, uh, that, that's great. The way they're kind of implemented and, and used really heavily all the way throughout Modo, um, it's really nice because when you get in there and you start doing something new with them, it, it benefits a, a whole host of things. So, you know, I think here we'll see some kind of simple, pretty cool examples, and then, you know, some really complex examples of where that can be used. So, you know, that's that's one thing we're looking at kind of from a design perspective is to make sure that we have some approachable tools that you can use for, you know, basic everyday stuff, and then, you know, be able to leverage that and get, you know, speed, reliability, predictability uh, with some very complex uses. Right, so the basic everyday stuff is what I'm all about. A lot of my work result revolves around that, a lot of product animation and things like that. So I'm gonna jump in and show some gradient editor stuff before we get to the sort of more advanced um, types of thing Rich is gonna show with some of his character rigs. But first off, I'm just gonna show some graph editor improvements. And so let me bring up Moto here. And I'm assuming this is streaming fine. And here we've uh, got the graph editor open and I have a cube, very exciting. Um, but the cube is just animated. If I just drag the timeline here, you'll see it's animated very far along the x-axis here, doing a little curve. And this is a type of situation that you see in 3D animation programs a lot is it's animating quite a bit on x way down here, but it's animating very little on y and z. I have to zoom in a ton. And so um, there's a big you know, disparate amount between these values. And it's hard to get them all in the scene at once. And now we can do something, there's not icons here yet, this is just a beta, but we can do something called normalized curves. And by pushing this icon, you see these boundaries here now, all the curves are viewable between this zero to one sort of normalization. Um, the values are the same, so this isn't something you would necessarily wanna work in all the time. You can see me dragging on this, and it's you know huge leaps in values where if I say drag on, um, 
on the y curve here, let me just get all three of these in again, um, it's very small leaps in values. So you see this is normalized. There's a different uh, levels of values being dragged here, but you know they're all viewable, which is nice. So you can get them all in the scene rather than having it like this. Uh, same with the rotation. Um, normalized, I can view them all at once. And whoops, let me grab the X. Yeah, but if it's not normalized, you know, Z is this huge rotational change and these are not. So that's nice. They can be normalized. And, but you could also do something called stacked, which I pressed this other button, which is going to be the stacked button. And now we can see them all at once. And so they're also all sort of normalized between these lines. And this is just another way of working really quickly. And you can imagine, I think Rich will show some examples later on, when you're working in character animation, especially with a ton of different channels or a character or a, a channel set, it's really nice to be able to stack these up like this. And you get the names over here and to work on them individually. Uh, we can also see velocity and speed curves here in uh, Moto Now, which is nice. Speed and velocity. Um, and I guess I had to Google the difference between speed and velocity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, man, okay. it's been a while since high school physics. Okay, fine, Rich. Tell me, what's the difference between speed and velocity? Uh, no, man, I'm going to let you go. I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> you got to bring up the Google uh, search. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Velocity is speed, but with a direction, right? So uh, speed is just the uh, change of uh, distance over time. Uh, velocity velocity also includes a direction so that's the difference so <laughs> scalar versus vector right we all know what those are oh so, my yeah. gosh so that's uh, a <laughs> speed and, speed and velocity all right uh, we also have stacked we also have normalized and uh there's one more button here and this is normalized all selected curves so you can um oh okay so you can just have selected curves and you can normalize those i assume as well so okay um there's also an interesting thing if i bring up um this torus here you'll notice that my torus uh, just is animated between 0 and 60, whereas the cube is 0 and 200. And what's cool here is I can now just press, um, if I, let me just pull up the dope sheet a little bit here. And, you know, we've got the whole scene. And we used to have to sort of drag and move this around to get this to isolate if we wanted to shrink our scene down, especially if we're working on something really large. So if you have a scene that's, uh, you know, a thousand frames, we have one thing animated over just 30 frames. Now we could just hover and hit A, and it, it shrunk this for us. I could just double tip or double click to go back and then hit A and it'll shrink it down. It'll shrink down the graph editor as well. So that's really great. So essentially what we're doing here is we're, we're with normalized curves and stacked curves and being able to you know double click and hit A, we're able to very quickly get to the information we need, right? We're very quickly able to view our curves, view our uh, dope sheet tracks and get to these keyframes without a lot of of this and this, right? Because who wants to do that all the time? Um, so also these are anti-alias now. There's other some there's some other niceties in here. I think the handles are working a little bit, you know, grabbing a little bit better. Um, yeah, and yeah, easier to pick them. Easier <laughs> to pick them. So those are some nice graph editor improvements um, on that aspect. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, uh, uh, Michael or, or Rich? Uh, no. I just using the the stacked curves uh, quite a bit and even the normalized uh, like you say we have you know that long uh, curve that you're working with and a couple other ones to get them all together is really nice uh, and uh, also just yeah I find myself hitting that a key just as much as I might do in the viewport and it's kind of nice to have that um, the other thing I wanted to just say is and I'll probably repeat this a couple times is the beta feedback uh, and alpha feedback was amazing on this you know we put some of the stuff out there put normalize out there, people banged it around and, you know, had some suggestions. And, um, you know, the lead developer on this was uh, Mark Brown, and he did an amazing job of, you know, taking that feedback, getting it nice, polished up and uh, and putting it out so that it would work the way users want. And that's uh, that's our, our goal. Yeah, it you know, Moto's whole thing from the very beginning was get get the application out of the way so that you can work, you know, and uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> right and being able to see multiple um animation curves expressed like visually super clean like that means that you can focus on the shape of your animation the performance of your animation and not worry about the numbers so once you've sort of keyframed everything out and then you can look at all these together you you can scrub your time adjust your key to, and, and you're seeing everything related to itself it really gets you in the flow i don't know if you've noticed that greg you're just you're constantly in there pulling and tugging and making the motion look great you're not really worried about is it two or three or a hundred or fifty? You don't care about that once you're in the 
making performance stuff. And right, right. You're, you don't want to have to worry about the numbers. And uh, it seems real obvious just to hit the A key to isolate it just like you would if you're modeling. Um, but those things don't – sometimes the obvious things aren't – you know, yeah. implement until like somebody's like, hey, you know, we should just hit the A key on the uh, it's uh, dope and sheet as well. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a perfect example. I mean, somebody brought that up on the beta and everyone was like, yeah, this is what we need, you know, uh, and, well, you know, next build it was out. So, um, again, we're, we're still, you know, we still have the open beta and uh, your feedback is greatly appreciated and implemented. Yes. So somebody, Mike Calhoun, had asked if you can grab multiple um <laughs> multiple handles at once and I, i'm not sure if you can can you grab multiple handles at once yep you have multiple keyframes so one like I, is this what you mean uh, you select the keys Mike? and then you can move the handle you should yeah so i think i think this is what i'm sorry guys you don't uh rich and uh Michael don't see my screen right now because I'm not sharing it with them unless they're watching the live stream but i'm, act I'm actually demonstrating uh, Simono, so i think this yeah. is maybe what you're talking about um uh, this, but um, if not, Mike, uh, uh, have a chat. Let me know. Um, let me just check the chat again. Make sure there's any other questions. Yep. Mike, oh, yep, with uh, and Rad. Okay, I guess that is all right. There. I can <laughs> so, see the notes. I just can't see the thing. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, so that's graph editor. I don't think I'm missing anything there. Um, and let me. I'm going to ease into gradients now. And uh, Rich and uh, Michael, I'm actually, you know, I should probably share my screen with. This. So this is sort of a Frankenstein setup here, guys. We've got a Google Hangout <laughs> window here to talk, and that and the whole desktop is going up via OBS. So I should probably, um, I can, I think I can. Let me just share my screen with uh, these guys. Hopefully, it doesn't kill bandwidth, and then I will um, uh, jump over to Moto here to show yes the entire screen uh to show this going on okay so back in moto and i assume uh rich and and, and mike we can follow along with me now right yeah yes yeah, you know okay so let me get this out of the way um okay so now we're going to talk a bit about gradients and this is um, where it gets really pretty cool and so this is just a little pmod setup with a replicator and some gradients that i put together really quickly and I think I'll just work through it backwards to sort of deconstruct it and put it back together so you can see how this works. Uh, let me just talk about the shader tree real quick. So in the advanced viewport, uh, gradients are visible in the shader tree now. So this is just a gradient on Y right here. So it's just this gradient on, um, on Y right here. So you can see if I drag these, I change it this color like that. And that's uh, duplicated and set to luminous color. And there's another gradient on luminous amount right here, where it's just uh, you know just the very top. So that's how we get the shading. Um, but we also have gradients all throughout this thing and uh, setting up this particle system. So the particle system just starts with um, a particle generator. And we've got, I think, 120 cubes one way and 60 the other. And this is fed through a couple of modifiers eventually to a replicator, and then there's just a little cube in the replicator. And so if you're familiar with PMODs and replicators, this should all make sense. But even if you're not, um, essentially what this is doing is putting little particles all over, and the replicator is copying the cube to all these particles. And then the series of modifiers, are, we're going to go in and use gradients to move them around. And the first thing we do with this first particle mo modifier is we're just scaling it up 180 degrees. And if I unhook the gradient and just drag this over here and bypass these, you'll see that what I'm doing here is it's just scaling up all these cubes 180%, I think I said degrees, 180%, just like that. Um, right. But the particle modifier has a gradient. And these are the gradients that are spread all throughout uh, Moto, whether they're on particle systems or on modeling operations or on deformers and, and fall offs and the animation side of things. And now we can manipulate these gradients procedurally. So this apply gradient is right here in my schematic. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a waveform gradient. And these are just here. You just go add. And over here in the gradient list in the schematic, we have all these gradients now. Gradient nodes, gradient blend, clamp, gradient for mesh, math, noise, offset, scale, step, waveform. And I'm going to put this waveform gradient right into the apply grad. And then you can see what it's doing there. In fact, if I just bump this up a little bit, get a little more of an indication of what's going on. And because it's a waveform, we have some 
um, different types of waveforms we can do. We can do a sine waveform, we can do a square, we can do triangle, we can do sawtooth, and we can also animate the offset. So here the offset is animated and that's how we get this effect like that. Nice. But you'll notice that some of these are, are going black and that's because a waveform, like a sine waveform, you know, the peak is at one and the, and the, the trough, the, the downside is a negative one. So we don't want a negative scale. So I add another node called gradient offset and I just have a one there and, and the Y. So we're just pushing that back up. So if I push my gradient offset um, over here, you'll see now I've pushed that up and now we don't have that issue anymore with the darkness going on. And then if we bump over one more particle modifier, this one right here is doing a little rotation. So I'm just gonna push this into the, uh, into the um, replicator. We can see a rotation going on here. And the rotation has a gradient source going as well. So if I have the gradient out and I just have the rotation going, they're all going 180 degrees. And you can kind of see me drag this, seeing all these guys rotate like that. But if I want to isolate that to just some particles, then I apply a gradient to my apply grad here. And I just hook up this same gradient offset. And now I'm only applying in the troughs. This offset is going a 0.1 on X and is going and zero on Y. So it's actually pushing it left, right, instead of up, down, if you can think of the sine wave pattern like this. And if I, if I could just click and drag, you can see, if I drag this, you'll see the difference, you'll see this sort of rotation moving left and right along all of these particles there. So that's the gradient offset node at work. And then if I go one more and I have a great a particle random modifier in here, and what this is going to do is just going to do a random modification for each particle of 0.5 in the y direction. And again, this is going to be um, modified by a gradient. So if I pull the gradient out, then sort of everything gets all jiggled around. But if I put the gradient back in, I'm only jiggling on these uh, peaks right here. And the same with the, the same place it's being... Um, scaled really high, right? And then of course it's all animated like that. And so that's how you get that effect. And so that's sort yeah. of the basics of how gradients are working. And it's then, super cool. yeah, super cool. So we go ahead and jump in. I'm sorry if I'm like just over talking. Oh, I, everybody. Just, you know, the, the ability to do some things procedurally and, you know, uh, take certain place, places like the troughs and not have those be affected um, just is, is really great. And I think you know, I hadn't seen anything uh, a lot happening with the particle side of things, but that is kind of why we try and implement this stuff across the board, because I've seen a lot of people doing things with bevels and other stuff, uh, mesh operations that are really exciting and cool with these new gradient options. Um, but obviously, you know, across the board into particles and rigging and other places, these are all places you can leverage these um, new gradient options and nodes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Rich, did you want to pipe in? Sure. You ready to, to, to hand it off? Well, let me let me do a couple more things, then I'll hand it off to you. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so let me let me just show a couple more nodes. We have a blend node here, and we have another waveform. This waveform is set to sawtooth, and so if I plug my sine waveform into my gradient blend node here, like this. Well, actually, let's do it. Uh, yeah, let's do it like this. And then do the blend in the outputs to all these guys like so. And then you'll notice my gradient node is blend zero to 100%, and I can drag that. And you can see I'm blending from sawtooth. Now I'm going to sawtooth, right, at 100%, back to sine. Right. And so that can be animated. So I'm blending between these two different nodal setups here. But you can also blend with a gradient. So here I've got another gradient, and it's just going from left to right there like that. Um, and you can you know drag this around like uh, this if I want more sawtooth or uh, you know go back and, and get more more sign. But I can also rig in another gradient into this gradient, right? So you can see how these cascade. So I can add a noise gradient into here, or yet another waveform gradient, or uh, hand draw one and put it in. So it's pretty interesting. In fact, if I want to just create my own hand-drawn gradient. I could just create a locator over here, just press L. And if you go over to user channels and add a user channel, just like you can add a float or a scalar, you can add your own gradient, just like that. You're, give it a you're name. You're totally taking my demo. You're totally taking my demo. I'm taking your <laughs> demo? Okay. We'll go back to your demo. We'll go back. No, okay. okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, this is really cool. You know, one thing I really like is all, all this stuff that you've kind of layered up for control and everything of that nature. Um, 
you know, it's all getting fed this particle system. And, uh, you know, you said something kind of about rigging and, you know, basically this is kind of a cool little rig setup, uh, you know, pretty quick to set up and, and work with, but feed it any other particle system and it's going to do this cool stuff to it, you know. Uh, so uh, it could be a particle system born from a plane or a sphere or uh, a car. And, you know, you get these these type of behaviors out of it, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah I, exactly. And I just want to say this for the record. I, I have not, on <laughs> purpose, I have not played with PMODs because I realize how I will lose myself in that for months. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to get the, I want to get the rig stuff done and, and everything there before because I, once I go down this rabbit hole, I'm going to go headlong, man, because <laughs> I it's so cool to watch you doing this stuff. Yeah, it is. It, this stuff is this sort of type for motion graphics. And just I love just sort of abstract art. And it's just so cool for this. And, and here we're just blending between um, our hand drawn one and the spline one. So you can you have so much control over this stuff now. And I can, of course, add procedural modifications to this hand drawn one if I want to go in and, um, you know, add a, a gradient step or do a scale or add some noise or do, do a little bit of here. Let's do a little bit of math. Um, in fact, I think I maybe had a math node already set up around here. Maybe oh, I did have a math node. So why don't we instead of a blend node, let's do a math node. So we're going to incorporate my hand drawn gradient. You are and, really good in my demo now. Oh, I'm good. Ah, <laughs> see, we should have. We should have. Yours is good. Rich is going to be a lot more interesting though in terms of character animation. So, so he's going to be applying this stuff to nodes you use for animation, where I'm really just applying this to uh, particle nodes. Um, but it it's sort of the, the same concept here. And so we've got a gradient math where we're averaging. We can. We can add, we can do uh, all kinds of stuff here with um, the math node. And so there's that. And so one more thing before we jump to Rich, and I'll just show, um, instead of showing particles, let's actually show a modeling operation. And so again, I'm just going to work uh, backwards here. And so we've got a curve sweep. We've got essentially, um, let me just undo this here. I should actually look at the chat real quick to make sure there's not questions popping up. Uh, uh, no, I think it's right, cool. a lot of people saying what you're doing is super cool. Um, you know, so so this is this is just uh, we've got a curve sweep operation, which is actually a new. Um, so we're going to use this little profile here. A lot of times I like to use procedural uh, shapes as the profile. Here we're using a procedural circle because you can always change that to a star or a cube or whatever. And we've got a curve sweep along this straight line curve here. This curve. Um, curve for curve sweep this curve right here this is this probably hard to see but there it is right there so pretty simple just a curve and a curve sweep and but what we have with the curve sweep is we have access to gradients and in this case there's a gradient for um for scale so if i unplug my gradient mesh my gradient uh, uh setup here you'll see it's just there's your typical curve sweep right but we can uh, start messing around with the uh, the gradient input for scale. And so again, let me just sort of work backwards here so I can add a waveform to it. Okay, so in this case, I'm adding a, let's just start with a sine waveform. Looks pretty familiar, right? There's the sine waveform. But we can turn that to something like a square. And then we can pipe this into an offset to sort of uh, bring everything into the positive um, area like that. And then we can use a gradient scale node. So you would just go up here and you would add a gradient scale node, like right here, and pop that in. And we're gonna pipe that in. And the scale node has some parameters here, so I can just adjust the scale. So I can get this sort of, you know, sort of like pipe-like look like that. And of course, since it's all procedural, I can always go back to my curve and, uh, you know, whatever, mess around with it, move it around like that. I still have that uh, gradient the shader tree active, so it looks kind of cool. <laughs> um, and again, again, I'm, I'm going to steal Rich's. Um, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> steal Rich's stuff here, but I can just again create my own custom gradient, right? I just created a locator and I added a user channel on there, and looking at it, it, it looks like uh, like this. And so I'm creating my own profile. In fact, let me just set this um, these to linear for right now. So, or not linear, uh, constant. So this is what you may uh, create something like this. And if I go back to the schematic and I plug this in, then, you know, that's kind of what I get, right? I get this shape right here. But what if I want to, you know, ha uh, scale it like I did with the other one? Um, so I can plug it into the scale node. 
just like that. Move that away and plug my scale node back into the gradient. And now I'm just getting this here, but I'm not getting a repeat. So we have to remember, go to go over to your gradient node here and uh, uh, set it to set it to repeat. And so we're going to set this to repeat and set it to repeat before as well. And here we're just drawing our own custom shape, right? So again, we're just you know doing whatever we want to in terms of creating this modeling operation. We're sort of, like Rich said, we're not looking at numbers. We're just sculpting what we want in the viewport to get you know like a bug antenna or whatever this may be here. But um, you know it's a combination of sort of you know hand drawing the profile we want in combination with uh, procedural gradient nodes uh, piped into these gradient channels in a mesh operation versus a particle system. So, um, right. so those are those are gradients there. I've got one other thing, which is a curve fall off. This is just uh, not a gradient, but um, there is a curve fall off now. And Rich, are you using the curve fall off? I know you use a lot of spline and, and uh, Bezier yeah. fall offs. It's okay. You can just take everything I'm going to show my demo. <laughs> you show it your way, and then I'll show up mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, ironic, ironically, I had done a curve fall off video that you can make your own with nodes like two weeks ago. Now that you're in, now it's being included as an actual tool. But dude, this is uh, awesome, by the way, though. Uh, absolutely show what you got. It's great. OK, so well, this is just real quick. So we just have a curve fall off here. Um, and this is just a fall off again. It's It's got these gradients so I can go in and and control these procedurally. I haven't here. I'm just actually uh, drawing them. You can see how I'm just doing a curve fall off from distance from curve. So here's my curve. There's a curve fall off. I've got this plane with a push operation, so I pull the fall off out, and it's just flat. You'll notice fall offs in a modeling operation. They go in the tool pipe. It doesn't actually say fall off here like it does in a deformer. It's just tool pipe, but they actually go in there. And so there's that, and you can also do a, a fall off along the length. So if I um, take my, uh, you know, my curve here and um, just use, like I say, I want to put them all at uh, x equals zero, like like that, and make it uh, linear. Is that x equals zero? Maybe, I don't know, like that. Um, I could actually change uh, this to, instead of doing it along the length, I can uh, do it along the, um, or I'm sorry, distance from the curve. I could do it along the length. So this is falling off as a distance from the curve right here. So fall off um, from distance. But, you know, I can put this sort of uh, back to normal um, and just go fall off along the length of the curve. And uh, I think, yeah. Right, yes, like so or so, <laughs> like that, is that right, maybe? Um, if I go along the length of the curve, uh, zero to one, like this, I have to go side view here, front view, side view. How do I, I have to tur turn off, oh, distance, radius zero. Or, right, right, so now I'm just going along uh, the length of the curve, so from left to right is actually, you can see it's moving up a little bit there. So anyway, that's curve fall off, so I'm gonna actually throw it over to Rich now, <laughs> and he's going to do anyway, show some stuff. I should look and be checking chat. Is there any questions popping up? No, actually, uh, Greg, if you could hop back to that, uh, the gradient uh, setup that you had a minute ago, the one oh, yeah. with uh, the extruded curve. Yeah. Uh, and pop back into the schematic. So you were doing a lot of really cool stuff in the schematic here. Um, and there's, you know, we're, we're really trying to make this a lot easier for people to get in and, uh, you know, make it not quite as complex. So we've added a few things. I think if uh, this would be under the unscripted demo uh, title, but I think if you double click on the gradient in the schematic there, uh, pick any one uh, just on its name, uh, the gradient itself. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so we're adding a lot of this stuff. So basically, you know, before when you had things, uh, so we got gradient, if you have a node with a color, uh, you double click on it, the color pickle will come up. Um, and we have all sorts of other cool little goodies in there so that while you're working the schematic, it's a little more, you know, easy for you to, uh, get to what you want. Uh, oh, which is that's great. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Because I kept having to jump over here, but really if I want to adjust this now, I just double click on this bad boy and it yeah. comes up. Okay. Uh, also things like you would find in the forms where, or in the channels list where you'd have you know, uh, an option and you might double click on the name uh, and, you know, that that would be something that normally you'd have to type in. Now you're going to get the pop ups of uh, those whatever three options you might have for those uh, nodes, which is really pretty cool as well. Oh, OK. Should I try that or is it going to crash on me? No, <laughs> I shouldn't go, right? <laughs> famous last words, right? Right. Hey, beta, beta, we're in beta. Beta. What am I clicking? I'm sorry, uh, Michael, uh, say that again. You know, like 
Uh, yeah, any channel that has like a multiple drop down list from the you know the from the channels where you get a little pop up. Um, yeah, so yeah, that one should be good, I think. Yeah, exactly. If you drag that over into the schematic. Oh, uh, I see. So drawing a oh, you double click. Oh, there. Okay, there it is. Yeah. Right, right. So that wasn't possible before. What we're yeah, we're trying to make it a little more approachable, a little easier for people to work in schematic with uh, with these types of things. Oh, that is awesome. excellent. So double clicking on. Uh, certain channel types and schematic will bring up sort of a context sensitive uh, viewport or drop down list or whatever it is. If they, if you want to edit that channel and you double click on it, the idea is it's going to give you the options right there. So that, that is awesome. Uh, yeah. So, previously, like in the draw mode, if you double clicked on that, you, you know, you, you could do something there, but you'd have to type in the string, uh, which is, you know, not, not as cool. Right. Excellent. That's okay. Cool. All cool. right. So yeah, thing that uh, that the devs added uh, pretty recently and uh, yeah very cool that's nice awesome. okay so let's go back to um, hangouts I think I was sharing screens on hangouts let me stop sharing and uh, this is this has got to be an easier way to say I once again I'd like to thank Google for canceling their products that like <laughs> three out of every four products they ever make hey guys here's hangouts right, it's great right. oh so it's awesome we keep, used keep all the time positive. hey guys we canceled hangouts keep, keep it positive Keep it positive. Because we're Google. All right. Keep it up. All right. So now um, Rich is going to share his screen and go a little bit deeper dive into gradients and um, some of their effects on falloffs and things like that. And again, this is sort of a double live, double streaming issue going on here because Rich is streaming to Hangouts, which is then going out via OBS. So hopefully the quality is 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 good. I'm just going to make my screen big here, and then uh, bring up the okay. chat list, and hopefully we're good. I'm going to share my screen. And we'll do that. Move this over here. So I'm going to start off by just taking a look at what I had to do before to build a lip rig in Moto 13.1, and then how the new gradients has made a difference in the quality and um, the speed for 13.2. So I figured that would be a great place to start. And then we'll I'll deconstruct kind of how I build these gradients up. So here is the um, the kind of the original. Uh, version of this, which is using spatial falloffs. So that's what these guys are here, is me building a series of falloffs that cascade across each other. So they're, they're physical falloff items in the scene that are projecting into the lips um, so that I can get the falloffs the way I need them to be. The downside to this, well, I should say at first, it's great that it's possible. Like, being able to, to use what Moto had to get it to work at all was awesome. The, the downside was that with this method for each of these bells, let me show what I'm talking about. So if I go into here and I, and I lift this up and then I go to say the mid. That's called the Elvis pose. Yeah. Hey, baby. <laughs> uh -huh. And then I do, and I, and I lift this, the middle guy up. Those are two separate deformers now. In this version, and I, and I name everything after Iron Man. So this is the Lips Rig Mark One. Uh, the new <laughs> one is the Lips Rig Mark Two. Um, it works, and I get good shapes. But it is it is one deformer firing, then a second deformer firing, and they're falling off in a smart way, so that they add up correctly. It works, but it's very inefficient. If you know, with the Lip Rig, there are literally seven positions across the lip that you have to work in. There's um, there's like the in, mid, out, these little guys here, which are like these little, this is the outside. And then I've got even little tinier little adjustments here to create. And, and these are just from experience. Animators want to be able to really tune the mouth corner to get a shape they need. So that means seven for the upper lip, seven for the lower lip, for each direction it needs to go in. So seven times seven for up and down, seven times seven for, you know, forward and backward, and so on and so on and so on and so on. So you end up with, with a lot of deformers working through these things, which from a system perspective is inefficient, right? And this is where it was really great working with the founder to go, okay, let's talk about these gradients. It was something that kind of was already in play. And then with a little adjustment, we end up getting um, what I'm calling the Mark II rig. And this is using gradients. So now when I do something like this and I lift this up, this is actually firing the, the mid, right? The center, you know, the outer, and then the end, and it's creating these shapes and bringing them up together. But instead of seven deformers, it's one. And it's one because I'm using 
I'm using gradients and gradient math nodes to attenuate a single deformer's effect. So it ends up giving me all this really spectacular control much faster and a rig that's much simpler. So to me, and somebody had asked me somewhere, you know, hey, I thought that, you know, 13.1 or 13.2 is supposed to be a speed release. And we were talking about all these features. And I look at this and go, it is a speed release. <laughs> I'm, I'm able to create shapes and build a complex rig and the rig itself. So just to, to give you uh, some context here, um, let's go to this. So here's some of the rigs you get. So this um, main lips rig, where are we? Here we go. Uh, da, da, da. So this is what we had before and it's still included um, with, with the bedroom stuff was 12.3 megs on disk, just the rig for the old one. The new version with all of the same control plus far more is six megs. It literally cut the file size in half. So what you did is you, you know, when you got the, the, the ability to use gradients in your rigging, some of the gradient nodes that I just showed, you're able to uh, sort of rip out uh, this whole cascading fall off um, uh, setup that you had and reset it up using these gradient nodes to get the same effect so the user would never know the difference other than it's faster. And yeah. uh, from the rigging perspective, I assume it's probably a little bit easier to set up on your end than having oh, to do that whole cascading it, thing. It's much easier. So here are our gradients, right? The oh, that's a edge. stacked layout. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So here's what it all looks like together. Um, so um, like here's our, our mid curve. So our mid gradient, I can take this and I can live adjust what's happening. You know, granted, I'm, I'm breaking it. But the fact is, I have this control. And it's all happening live. And I can say I wanted to adjust this and how this one works and how it dives into the other. And what's nice about gradients is I can artistically assign these shapes and visually see them all together where when you're dealing with five fall offs that are adding together, you have to look at them each individually. You really can't line them up and see them and how they connect to each other. So it's just it, everything about this is better. It's easier to author. It's faster to evaluate. It's smaller on disk and it gives me more control. To me, this is the epitome of what Moto and like what it's all about. It's like we have gone and taken something and said, how can we make it better in every dimension? And, and it was done. So I'm yeah. excited. Absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> big thanks to you, Rich, for working with us to make this happen. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to echo exactly what you said. I mean, you know, we're looking at speed increases, but not always through brute force. Um, you know, when we can make it simpler and faster, I mean, that's, that's a huge win. Um, so, you know, to be able to take something that took a long time to set up, uh, was difficult to kind of dive into and maybe even not as approachable for a lot of users, um, and make it a lot simpler, a lot less nodes and then get, I mean, what did you say? Did you have a, like a two X speed increase or something like that? Oh, it went from by itself. It went from eight frames, eight to 10 frames a second to 20, 25 frames a second. Yeah, that's so amazing. Depending on how you do the math, it's two to three times the speed. Yeah, but and that that's really what we want. I mean, I, again, from I look at things from a design perspective. From a design perspective, we're looking at these tools and the way we implement new stuff, as well as how you're working with some of the older stuff, and uh, you know, trying to make it simple, fast, easy to use, and powerful. Yeah. So anyway, it's I'm really really happy with this um, and where where it's gone to. So anyway this is good stuff and obviously in in the the training course i'm putting together i'm covering all this in, in real detail and you get all these rigs too so um i've got them now i haven't updated it on the site yet so kai string will see these new lip rig and all of the helpers because i actually this is how it happens right that means i had to create all these new ideas so this five zone gradient stuff is now just done it's something you drag and drop it's already going to all work together and then up lip with the rig put in all it's it's awesome stuff. So that all get dropped in in the next couple of days. Um, all right. So let's let's take a look at authoring this idea, because this you look at this and you go, well, wow, it's really complicated, Rich. And it is, you know, I mean, if we go into the rig, you can see all the different pieces and all the different stuff. And it can be really can blow your mind um, in, a, in a bad way <laughs> when you're thinking about authoring it. But fundamentally, it's actually pretty straightforward. 
So I'm figuring now, and this is where Greg already beat me to the punch with so many things. We're going to take, I'm going to take this right now and I'm going to quickly just add a single deformer and I'm going to create a curve fall off with some gradients. And I'm going to show how you can attenuate a deformation with a gradient. I'm just going to build it from scratch because it's really not that complicated when you think about how to add the pieces together. So any more things you want to throw out, Greg, to beat me to the punch and, and get ahead of my demo? No, go for it. So just okay. just keep in mind this is um, this is this is a gradient uh, with deformation where I was showing gradients with particle systems and modeling operations. Um, yeah, same I, thing. I was just I was just picking on you, man. I was just playing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd also like to point out that in a lot of uh, kits and plugins by third party developers that are that are made for Moto, um, they include gradients. So if you use like uh, Geo, Geo from Curves from Mario Baldi. He has tons of gradients scattered throughout all of uh, those plugins. Those are all now riggable with these gradient nodes yeah. that are available. I, I'd like to, I'm going to talk about Mario after I'm done here too, because uh, there's some really cool stuff that he's doing that's going to come to come to kite string too. All right. So let's do this. All right. So we have this and I want to create that shape, right? That we've got, that we wanted to make. We're just going to, we want to make a gradient, a rounded something happening with this. So the first thing we want to do is we're going to create a simple effector. So I'm just going to create a locator, right? And I'm just going to call this move. Um, and I will call it move, not mauve, effector. And I'm just going to make a simple deformer. So this is our effector, and we don't want to be there. I'm going to go to my mesh ops panel, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to create a um, general influence. So let's add a general influence. So effectors describe deformations and influences apply and we're just going to go like this so now i've got this thing here that's going to apply when i move this to whatever i tell it to uh, that, so that i'm going to stop like that's a really great way of explaining that um <laughs> because there's a little bit of confusion i think sometimes how moto works and if you zoom in in your schematic just a little bit rich so it's bigger in screen exact i'm just repeating what rich said like the the effector which is essentially uh, often something you get to move around in the viewport um, describes the deformation that you want, right? But but that, that influence right there applies Apply. it, right? So right now it's applying to entire mesh. Uh, but you have a lot of uh, a lot of options in terms of applying to it. This is sort of separating these two things in, in Moto is actually really powerful. Yeah. Um, hold on a second. My wife just texted me. Just tell everybody in the universe that I love my wife, Kelly, and I will, I will call you back after this live stream. <laughs> <laughs> House isn't on fire, right? No. no, no, no. But I've made it a habit if she calls, even if I'm in the stage with, in front of a thousand people, that I pick up the phone. So uh, <laughs> she, she is now super gun shy about calling me. Uh, all right. So now we have this. And what I want to do is I want to say, hey, I want to, to move these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my mesh and I'm going to go in my vertice mode. I'm going to select all these vertices. I'm going to create a weight container. So now what I've done is I've made this element here that contains the weights values. By default, they went to one. That's why this looks red. And I'm just going to call this move. And I'm going to call it WC for weight container. That's just me being crazy about naming. I'm going to wire this in. Describe the motion, applies it. What am I applying it to? So now if I take this and I move it, let's get out of that mode and I move it, you're going to see that it moves all of those points there and this button here lets you see the weights okay so all right cool i'm moving it up and down but that's not what we want what i want to do is i want to move this up based off of that gradient so how do you do that so the first thing you need to do is create the gradient that's sort of going to describe what you want to do and now we can have user gradients in moto so i don't have to hijack a gradient somewhere else i can make my own so I'm going to go here and I'm going to add and I'm going to go under locators. I'm going to grab a group locator, which is just like a little folder icon. So I'm going to call this gradients. It's rig time with Rich. I feel like I should be painting trees. Um, so, yeah. Where's the app? <laughs> so now I'm going to do is I've got this. And if you go over to user channels here, you can add a user channel. And just like uh, Greg showed, we're going to add a gradient. And I'm just going to call this gradient. There's no reason for this to be um anything else and so if you're wondering why you used a folder i'm just guessing here you're it's, they just don't show up in the viewport right so they don't clutter up the viewport and and they well they gradient a, is a channel right oh yeah yeah i i tend to use those as containers for channels and values because i don't yeah exactly exactly right. what you said. i don't want to clutter it up so now i see this now i've got my gradient here 
I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna drag this into my scene. Um, by the way, I've mapped keys, and I think this is one of those useful, helpful things that we should get in there. Michael is being able to add, remove one, or remove all. I've mapped to keys, and I use like crazy in the schematic. Cool. Um, so now I've got this gradient, and mm -hmm. it's not doing anything. It's just there. So let's let's actually do this double click thing that he talked about. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to make a simple bell. Middle mouse adds key, drag that, and I want it to be a value of one, and I want this to be a value of one here. So now I have a very simple gradient. At zero, it's zero. At 50%, it's one. And at one, it's zero. Yep, little shape that you can see here. So now I have some value in here. And you go, OK, well, now how do I connect this to things? Well, this is where the new curve fall off comes into play. So what we want to do is create that node. So I can do that here. Um, under add, I can just type in curve, and I should see the curve fall off in my list here. Why don't I do this instead? And we want a curve fall off. Oh, there we go. So now I have this. Now you'll see, okay, okay how am I going to set this up? What am I going to do? So what we need to do is go into our channels list here and grab the gradient and drag that over. So now my curve fall off can be attenuated by a gradient. Now what does a curve fall off need? curve. So now we need to say, all right, I've got this fall off node and I have this gradient and I can wire this into here and to there, but I need to be able to say, well, what am I, what am I attenuating? Right? So I've got a curve, I've, I've got my gradient and I've got this curve fall off. So now we need to create a physical curve in the scene. So I've got an empty mesh layer here. I'm going to go to my modeling and go to curve and I'm literally going to just do this. I'm going to say, I want to start here as my start point, and here is my end point. Okay, so now I have a linear curve that is from here to there. Now I'm near. Now I'm far. All right. So now we'll go here and not do the Grover voice. <laughs> scale this down. So I'm going to set my action center to origin. Not sure if that was Rich or something living in his garage. No, it's Grover. <laughs> what are you it's just Grover. Do? Pay no attention. Just, just Grover. All right, so now if I hide this, you'll see that I have this curve. And let me also hide our curve ball. So you can see it. Right, so here's our print. So now I'm going to take this curve and bring it into my the schematic here. And actually, don't autosave. I know that that's valuable. Don't ever turn off autosave. I just get frustrated by it. Um, so here's my curve. And I'm going to wire this into here. And now what I've done is, and what's going on, is the system knows, Moto knows, that this curve has an internal parameterization. Big word. But what it means is the value at the beginning of the curve is zero. The value at the end of the curve is one. And it blends along its whole length so that it's, in a way, its own fall off already. It knows that it has a value, a parametric value of zero to one. So what we're saying is take that value, any points that get added to this fall off will then get this new weight value. They'll actually get multiplied by this weight value. So that means if I do this, and actually I'm going to disconnect my gradient, take my fall off, I'm going to wire this into the fall off. Now, if I move my gradient, I'm going to get this. So what's happening, this curve is zero here and one there, is now multiplying that weight value that it's getting from this curve against this weight that's being input into my influence and being moved by this effector. It's a very clear way to see what's happening. That when I move, let's set this to normal and we'll grab this. When I move this up and down, right, it's being attenuated by the parameterization of that curve. So okay. Rich, you may want to actually select the curve fall off um, node and show the properties value and and see that the gradient that's in the schematic there is that gradient right there. So 0% well, on the left, didn't move at all. 100% on the right, moved up. Right. Um, and this is based off of the internal parameterization that's coming from the curve. Exactly. That's important. Now, what happens when I take my gradient and I wire it into here? Let me turn this off. Now, when I take this gradient and go into here, ta-da. Now, what it's done, if you we look at this again, is it's remapping like gradients do 0 50% 100% 0 0.5 and 1 i've now attenuated the shape of that movement based off this gradient you can see 
how valuable this can be for an animation control, especially when you looked at the what I did with the lips, it's really this. It's, I now want the center shape to be this. Now you go, okay, this is cool, but what? how do we get it where we've got multiples added together? So this is our first simplest way to solve the problem. Create a gradient, I'll wire it into a curve fall off, set a curve, give you input. So now what we need to do is we need to create a couple of other gradients. So let's let's go in here and add a few more. Well, actually, we'll just add two so that um, we don't get too funky with the cheese whiz here. So I'm going to call this in grad. And I'm going to call this out grad. So now I've created two gradients on here in and out grad. I'm going to go ahead and take this out of here right now. And we're going to set this value to zero. I'm going to sneeze because, you know, live. Uh, all right. So now we go, all right, cool. I've got my curve fall off. How do I take two gradients and add them together? Right. Well, first of all, let's create a shape that makes sense. So I'm going to do this. We're just going to set the value to one. I'm going to add here and we're going to say make you zero at one. <clears throat> Oops, I did the wrong value. I want that to be zero and I want that to be one. Go figure, making mistakes. All right, so there's that. And then the outgrad, we're going to do exactly the opposite. So I'm going to middle mouse, create a new gradient. I'm going to do this. And now I've got two gradients that are crossing each other. Okay, so I want to add these two up. So how do we do that? Well, that is the gradient math node that Greg already showed. So let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to, I'm never going to let you let me get over that. So now if I take this and I input it and I take this and I input it, right? This input here can take multiple inputs. And if I do that now, when I move this, you can move it all up. And why is that working correctly? Because the gradients, if we look at them, add up directly. Can we do both? Oh, <laughs> love it. It's because the math of these two is perfect, right? So if I take this and start moving it down, right, you're going to see that change. It's adding the result of these two together. So if we go back to the lip rig and we see, um, you know, all of this stuff, which is, you know, curve madness. Um, probably should have. Now I'm going off script too, just like Michael. Um, right. That's what this was happening here is I've built a series of splines, sorry, gradients, and I've intelligently made them add up together to get me a final shape that I wanted. This takes experience and, and just understanding what you need. But what's great about this is you can tweak it and see it live with this simple example. So, so what you're doing, um, just to uh, uh, recap, is your math node is, is set to add. And in the simple example, like you said, those two gradients, uh, because they're inverses of each other, if you add them up at any point along the x-axis, they add up to one. So everything gets yep. a one, everything moves up together. But what you've done with this lip rig is you have uh, half a dozen gradients in there, um, at very specific shapes to add up in very controlled ways to yep. get the shapes that you want. So the next step you go, all right, well, this is great, Rich, but how do I animate this? Because you, you can't animate moving this up and down inside the graph editor, right? That's not how it works. Yet, I hope. Well, hey now. Hey now. <laughs> um, let's not put Michael on the spot. All right, so now what I want to do is add a gradient, and we want a gradient scale. So what this does is it has these channels, amounts, right? And I'll put them all in here. We'll just add them in, right? So this allows me to animate the amount in the X, the amount in the Y, which is a scale, center x and y so i can push it and move it around so now if i was to take this in gradient and put it into here and output this into my add right this is my shape now if i take my gradient let's take these channels and if you do the um, c key when you're in item mode you're going to get the channel hall tool so now what i can do is i can scale its effect up and down this is what i'm doing in the y i can push it in the x oops that didn't work Oh, ha, that's actually centering where the scale takes place. Hold on, I'll show you what this means. So now when I'm when I'm scaling this up and down, right, you can see what it's doing. Yeah, that's cool. Right. So that is what is what what's that doing is it's actually scaling the the gradient from the left to right or right to left. Right? So if I set the center X at 0.5. Now when I do the amount scale, it's actually scaling it from the center of 
the gradient, not from the zero. So this, the center X and Y sets the point of where the scale or the amount will take place and allows you to animate it, which allows you to do really, really cool stuff. So now I've got this amount that I can animate. So if I go here and I create a new gradient scale, so let's do that. And I will add the channels in here just so we can see. I go here and I go there. Now, if I look at the amount Y and I set it to zero here and I set the <coughs> Y to zero here, then now I can animate these two things together, right? And I can say, oh, I'm going to lift the lip up this way and then I'm going to lift the lip up that way and I'm going to lift the lip up that way. The, the, the extraness to this is that you create amount channels that you wire into this amount and that's how i have the lip rig going you know in mid and out or whatever and i animate from zero up it's it's literally the the range of the deformer is set to wherever it needs to be because i can change that live right i can take this move and decide how much i want this to be but when you get the rig it's actually taking something that's on and multiplying it off and you're just reintroducing the effect that's already described in there it's cool stuff. So what you're doing is taking a number of these manipulation nodes, whether they be scale nodes or math nodes, and using those channels to give sort of recognizable values like zero to 100 or something to a user um, mm -hmm. to manipulate the rig. Yep, yep, uh, that's exactly what's happening. That, this is a really good example of, uh, I, I, I have seen and kind of gone through the previous um, set up with with rich and uh, yeah it was this is so much more simple um and i think i think much more powerful um you know the way you explain it here rich is really great and uh, then you know when we look at this the same thing like you know we're doing this with a plane but any of this could happen with particles bevels geometry uh, all sorts of different things which is really awesome yeah and it's it's faster and better and gives you more control um, so it's like there's really no downside to it as far as I can see. Um, anyway, that's gradients. Do we want to shift gears into the world of IK or what do we want to do? Yeah, I mean, I think we got to get to some IK. Yeah, yeah. so I'm just going to do the simplest of simple. I'm going to go in here and make a series of joints and we're going to look at it and just show you kind of what the solver can do. So anybody that's used Moto realizes that that IK had some issues. We, we struggled with getting stuff out. So... You know, this is one of those things where you guys were like, all right, let's take a hard look at IK and what can we do to make it better? And that's that's where we are now. And I'm I'm very, very excited by it. So I'm going to create a simple dog leg type IK because this is the one that is very hard to emulate in the current system. I'm going to go ahead and select my joints. Can I just say something real quick? And werewolf movies are all wrong. The dog knee is the same as a human knee. They have an extended ankle. Their knees are not reversed. People. That's true. That is true. That yeah, no. second joint there that looks like a knee on a dog is a knee, just like a human. We have really short ankle bones, like basically none at all. They have really long ones. They can run really fast. That's well, that part yeah. sticking out at we the bottom. In, if, we, if we want to get into an anatomy lesson, I can certainly get into that. Just saying, werewolf movies... All right. All right. So now we're going to go to our IK tab and we have this apply IK. You click this, you come out of here, and you have a three bar IK that just works right out of the box. So explain what three bar is. There are three bars one, two, three. Three bars so and three joints. Three joints. Well, okay. it's four joints, it's three bars. Three bars. Okay. Right. Sure. You've got four points of you know, rotation, but you only have three segments that actually rotate. So in my world, anyway, that's, that's what I call that. Um, so let's sure. see. well, it'd be three bone IK as well. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, this, this is our setup. Now what's cool is this is not just a, Oh, Hey, great. I've got IK. Um, you know, we actually have a lot of control now in what the solver does, which is really cool stuff. So let's go here to my IK setup. And I'm just going to grab this and here, and actually I really don't even need this. Um, we can take a look at some of the things. So angle bias, for instance, <clears throat> this is saying how much rotation do you want to go from the upper joint to the lower joint? 
right? Your two, your mid. So uh, this is the knee, as Greg so elegantly put. This is the hock. That is the word I use for that, which is basically the wrist, if you think about it. And this allows you to define where you want the bias to be. So now if I grab this and move it, all of my rotation or most of it's happening at the knee, not at the hock. And if I go back to my IK here and I set my angle bias, right, and I go here, now when I move my IK goal, you're going to see more movement at the bottom. Oh, that's cool. Top. Yeah, this is awesome to have this type of control for sure. It's really important when doing any kind of um, uh, creature type you know, stuff is like having this ability and there's, there's more and tons of control, right? So when I, when I do this, there are now two points of flap or rotation for this, um, for this IK chain. So if I go to my IK here and I go to my different orients. So now there's a global orient where you can literally swing the entire IK solver around. Okay. Or I can say, rotate just the lower section or just the upper section, right? So this is like serious, high quality control of your IK system. Like the kind you need when you're crafting a shot with art direction and art directors and animators that are specific and looking for key silhouettes, this is the kind of control you need. And it's something that hasn't really been there in Moto and now is, and I'm beyond stoked. Yeah, so, I mean, this is the goal is to make something, you know, uh, very, first off, very predictable um, and uh, easy to set up. Obviously, you know, you select leg, you say uh, apply IK um, and to have, you know, some some powerful parameters to, to deal with. But there's not 100 there um, that you have to tweak and, and do all, all sorts of stuff, you know, just enough to get you this. Um, extra level of control that you want. Um, and, uh, you know, like Rich said, it's art directable and predictable. Well, yeah. one of the nice things is I think a lot of people are going to be experiencing this new IK solver without ever really knowing it because what they'll be doing is using a, a rig from Kite String or a rig from Advanced Character uh, Setup that Lukas is working on and, and has put out some videos on. And these rigs that you get. Um, as an animator or just somebody who needs to do a quick, uh, say, even just like a human posable uh, animation for a medical video or something like that, you don't have to dig into this, but the people who are the professional riggers will have rigs set up where all this stuff is already built in, and you, they'll just have some human readable channel there, like, you know, swing out D or whatever it is that you can use to um, pose your character. And getting back to the beta, I mean, obviously, Rich, uh, Lukash, uh, Sergio, and a whole host of other riggers, uh, you know, we took the input from everybody, um, threw it in a blender, uh, made sure we got something that was really cool and nice and everybody could work with, and we're continuing to do that. Um, so it's not this uh, one and done type of thing. We're going to make sure that, um, you know, this stuff works really well. Yeah, I want to show there's more stuff before we go. Um, yep. So now you've got this softness. Oh, this, this is super, super cool. Right. So now if I go here, I, I put it to a big value. But what will happen is as your as your goal is extending, it's taking a second. It's it's giving it's not snapping into the view. Now, two five is way too high a number. I find that point zero one is what I like. Um, but the idea is when when you reach your end, there's a bit of a of an easing out. So you never get that IK snap now. It's it's clean. Oh, that's it's really cool. So if it's animated, what you're saying is it, that's taken into, that's interpolated over frames if you animate that locator. Absolutely. And your your character is not going to be like yeah snapping into position. It's and you actually... see that all the time with you know early IK solvers is that you you end up with not thinking about how an, a, a joint actually ends up connecting to its full length. It never snaps like you know, mathematically harsh. So honestly, setting this to a nice low number just gives you a nice clean result. It's it's fantastic. So <laughs> that's that. Um, and then lastly, we have IK scale. So now I can go here and I can say that I want to allow my whole chain to scale. So now if I grab the IK and I move it to its end, it stretches. So now you get nice stretchy Beautiful. IK. Oh, wow. And Look at that. So yeah. any rig that's using the new IK solvers will just have stretchy IK built in. You yep. got it. And there's, well, there value, there's a bunch of answers. Values that are nice and clean that you can use too. 
to drive other effects. So it's not just these values. There's also nice output values you can use. But mm -hmm. check this out. I can say I want all of my scale to only ever happen at the end. So I can set the base to zero and the mid to zero. Now if I take this and I move it, only the last joint scales. Oh, man. That is and awesome. And you can animate all this. And you can give it different percentages. So the math can get a little funky when you've got 1.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, whatever, whatever. But the fact is, if you go, I, I want only a little bit on the base now, I can create something where it's stretching a little bit at the top and more at the bottom and none in the middle. But yeah, that's actually, that, yeah, that's such a, a, a really insightful feature there. Because again, if you're an animator, you're just trying to get your thing posed like a, you want to posed or your director wants to posed or the game <clears> requires it to be posed. And this gives you tools for really fine tuning that pose by determining which joint stretches more than the other. Well, yeah, the, the, the developers on this were superstars. The lead developer Remini was really awesome uh, getting this stuff working. And if you just go back to that IK rich, I mean, all these features, what, is there like 10 parameters there or, or yeah. uh, you know, so it's not a flood of different stuff to do all this amazing, you know, you got stretching, you got rotation around the second bar. Um, and uh, it, it's just, it's really nice. And even that soft parameter, you know, those were things that started out with four different things to twiddle around with. And we distilled that stuff down into one soft parameter that really works nice. You got to set one value for it. You can set it high or low. Um, but you can, you know, get rid of that snap just on really basic rigs. Yeah. And just to, to show that this is the beauty. This is, I call this the under the hood factor. This shows you what you need. You never have to think about it. It works the way you expect. For people like Sergio and Lukash, myself, that like to dig under the hood and get all the data, the node itself has all this amazing output data. So global orients, local rotations, all kinds of amazing stuff that we can use to drive complicated rigs on top of it. So it gives you the ability to just use the joints and not think about it or really dig in under the hood and get and extract data out that you need. So I'm really, really yeah. happy with with the new IK. So um, and it's faster than the old IK, right? So it's it's better. It's faster. It's simpler. So it kind of rolls back. I'm going to stop. Sharing. Well, that's really forward thinking. And I, I really like the idea that you guys have guys like Rich uh, Lucas. Again, these are people with um, uh, their often on the forums or on the Slack channel. Uh, Lucas, of course, is doing Advanced Character Setup 3, and uh, Sergio, um, a feature film veteran who works with a variety of packages like uh, Maya, I think Houdini as well. Mm -hmm. um, being able to have experiences, again, also from Pixar, of course, with Rich, from various packages and all the R&D over the years that have gone into those, but then also being able to d distill it down into something like you've got 10 inputs you know, exposed or so to the user, Honestly, a lot of guys, like I said, are just going to be using pre-built rigs from KiteString or, or ACS where you're not even going to get those. But the forethought to put in a bunch of outputs um, that I'm sure that you sort of master riggers really requested, like, look, we're making a big, you know, a dragon. I need to be able to get a rotational output from this IKA chain to plug it into something else and be able to put those into that node. And so you can really get, um, you're not, you know, hamstrung by by a node that that's not really forward thinking. So that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, Greg. That was that was def definitely the goal. Uh, is uh, like like I said, you know, for the general everyday, maybe even ninety percent of users who are doing simple rigs, present them something that's powerful, easy to use. But then, yeah, for advanced users, uh, this is you know the rigging toolkit inside Moto is going to be incredibly powerful. I agree, and and I would say everybody keeps saying you know ACS and Rich or Kite String. You know that Lucas and I are talking about how to put. The, his chocolate my peanut butter together right oh that's too scary uh, just, just so you know that we are working together so that my rigs can be deployed using his tools just it's not going to happen at the gate but we are in talks about that so it's gonna be awesome uh also just a big you know uh high five to rich and lucas and sergio and all these other guys i mean i've gotten these guys on calls and been like hey you know you're in this time zone you're here we got to talk to somebody in london Let's make this happen uh, and make sure everybody's on the same page and understands what's going on and we're producing the best tools possible from a user perspective um, and, you know, a speed perspective. Um, and they, they've really been great. Awesome. Well, no problem, man. I dig it. I'm excited. This is, uh, this is a fun kind of uh, rigging and animation resurgence with Moto, and I am, I am on board. I'm digging it. 
Uh, so the, here's a question. Now, this may not be, I don't know if there's an answer to this or I'm even thinking about this the right way because I'm not a Unreal or Unity user. But for people making um, game characters that uh, simpler geometry and maybe a simple IK driver, is is this is that is the IK generally exported um, or compatible with uh, something like the Unity engine? I don't know how to answer that right now. <laughs> but the general the general bones <laughs> in IK should go over. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a not to talk about a sort of answer, maybe. Okay. No, no. It's, oh. <laughs> I, I, I think that. Um, IK solvers exist in those packages, and there's always a translation between the host DCC and the game engine. If you have an advanced IK solver like we have here in Moto, it's a matter of <clears throat> what is compatible on the game engine side, what comes over for free, and what kind of uh, considerations you have to do. Because you can bake out the animation of those joints as just single matrixy movements, and that play back in the game engine, no problem. Like, you don't need live IK in Unreal, right. you just need an animation that pushes those joints around or those deformers around in the way you need. So, yeah, and that's more common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get the the, the baked out matrixy movement and you apply it in the engine, so you don't have to worry about it. It's right. Okay. Live, animatable IK in the engine to do something is when it can get more complicated. Sounds. Yeah, good. we didn't even actually get to the uh, setup mode stuff. There, I mean, there was a lot of back and forth to make sure that this stuff worked well going in and out of setup, and um, you know, that's that's something important that we're focusing on too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't say that, but now you can literally go into setup, readjust the position of your joints, and the IK will adapt to that change. So that is something the old two D IK couldn't do. So now you get the ability to fit your rig and adjust your fit with the IK, which is great. Yeah, that's great. It's really important to me to, uh, to be able to set that up and change it a little bit after. It's good. Yeah, it's essential. So anyway, that's the general idea. I, I will say, I, I mentioned it, I teased it a little bit earlier, but you know, Mario Baldi is doing a lot of really cool things in Moto, and he's about to create a new kit um, w with deformers, and that's actually going to be available through KiteString. Um, and anybody that has a KiteStream membership is going to get a discount on his tools. And he and I have been working on all kinds of cool deformation effects, helpers, um, weight export, all kinds of fun things um, so that you can get the most out of these rigs and apply them into other pipelines. Um, so anyway, he's, he's listed up on the site as a, as a cadre member, um, and that's because he's going to be delivering tools directly through the site, which is going to be awesome. That's cool. Yes. Exciting, yeah. So Mario Baldi, uh, responsible for Geo from Curves, Tracer X, um, uh, some of the Edge. What's the Edge one he did? <laughs> well, <laughs> evens out the edge of some modeling ones. But yeah, so you've got him, obviously a talented uh, developer. And so you've got him uh, doing doing your work for you now, Rich, it sounds like. <laughs> oh, no, it's not that. It's not that. We've, we've got a shared vision uh, and hairline, as it turns out. But uh, <laughs> he's a shiny unicorn, man. This is somebody who can write code. Uh, rig, sculpt, texture, animate. It's like, yeah, there's very few people as talented. Yeah, anymore. he's an artist as well. He actually um, has some really cool character <laughs> art. And I think he had initially created some of these tools just to help out with his actual exactly. art production. Exactly. He's he's a phenomenal artist. So. Lucas does that too. Lucas is one of those guys from ACS3 who's this freaky talented artist slash programmer. Yeah. What's the deal with those guys? <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I, don't know. I'm, I am a one-trick pony. It's like I know modeling and I know rigging and I know how to think this way. But you asked me to shade something. I'm like, well, I don't have any idea. <laughs> I wrote a text adventure in basic on my Atari 800 in 1980. You're winning. Three. Hey, 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 hey. I was always a big Zork fan. Oh, um, yeah. That inspired by Zork. There you go. Mine was yeah. way worse, though. <laughs> Zork's still good. You guys should go out and play it. Yeah, you know, I had my daughter play that. You can get that uh, online now. And uh, yeah, it's like, yeah, learn to type, man. Here, play this text adventure. <laughs> so, uh, um, so I think I think we've kind of covered everything uh, in terms of animation and rigging in 13.2. I'd like to point out that uh, the cadence with these releases is so fast. I kind of feel like we just did 13. I've seen this every time, but we just did 13.1. 13.2 is already out. And by the way, there's going to be a series of these videos. We'll do a rendering one and a modeling one. There's there's a bunch of other stuff in 13.2 uh, 
um, coming out, um, including uh, we'll get a preview or take a look um, at, at the Path Tracer, I think is the one thing everybody is really interested in in the rendering uh, live stream. So I'll get information on when that is coming. Keep an eye on the Pixel Fondue page. And I tend to try and get these things put out and Foundry will put out the word as well. But if you're a subscriber, I think you get um, notified automatically if, if there's a live stream coming. So um, You mean a Pixel Fondue subscriber? Yeah, Pixel Fondue subscriber. I think you get notified of the live stream. You may want to do something like that. Yeah, but we should probably do something with Kaistring as well. I don't know if you could like cast do something sort of subscribing things. You have these people. I just saw somebody on, on the chat saying, oh, you know, there's not enough tutorials in Modo. And I'm like, there's like a thousand so videos on Pixel Fondue. We're not yeah. getting the word out, obviously, if if, if, the, yeah. if we're not. So so some, hey, some interplay. Yeah. I don't even know that we mentioned uh, William's um, boot camp, the weekend boot camp, which is awesome. Oh, I did not know that. Uh, I should uh, I should have talked to William before that. Although William just uh, put out a book, um, another topology book on character heads. I've seen a ton of awesome character heads being um, yeah, rendered and cool. modeled. And I, I don't, Rich, is there any thought? I don't, I'm throwing a lot of work at you. Is there any thought of putting uh, out a rigging system or adapting your facial rig? To those. Well, that's the beauty of these space rigs and weight containers and morph containers, right? It's like all you have to do is fit my rig to his mesh and know how to weight it and get it done. And when you do that one time, so let's say William or I were to go and take his character and rig it up with all the new weight transfer tools and the, the topology syncing that Moto has, you literally can rig one of his characters with my rigs and if you get a new shape, you can poke a button, make transfer one shape to the other, refit the controls in setup mode, and your rig is done. That's the beauty of and, right. and I haven't showed that stuff off yet. It's kind of like the next level for me to show, but the ability to reuse rigging in Moto is better than anything out there. I just haven't yeah, got where I can show it. <laughs> yep, and we're on we're looking to make it even easier too. Uh, we got some pretty cool plans down the pipe. Yeah, I think that'd be really cool if somebody wants to take up uh, take up that challenge and, and you know get on Kai String and get rig uh, Rich's uh, facial rigging um, uh, assemblies and fit them to the standard uh, topology uh, head that uh, uh, William put out. And then, like Rich said, once you weigh it, uh, really, then any head, any of the thousands of variations of heads, will just you just load them up basically and you know, hook them. He's into basically the doing the same thing I'm doing, right? He he's using his method to create his style of topology and character but but the idea of rig reuse weight reuse and shape reuse it's exactly zoe the character i'm using it's got a higher count it's got a little more topology because there's certain shapes i want to hit with them but it's the same idea i will reuse that mesh over and over again for any human so if, if you're creating let's say a game or a, a short film or something and um you're creating heads then obviously uh, or b full bodies, it, it behooves you to plan this out and create them with the same topology. So when you do the rigging, you can take advantage of Moto's um, things like weight containers, warp containers, and these fitting tools. So you really, it, you really just you know rig once, model mini or whatever. Well, I'll 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 leave with this. One of the things that coming from a big studio pipeline where you have these sets and these things set up to make it where you can spend more of your time on the art of rigging and the art of things and not so much on the tech side, a lot of that, that idea of getting to there takes advantage of these ideas, being able to easily have, have a standard mesh that you start with that you can transfer everything to and then adjust down the line. Having rigs that you don't have to create each time from scratch that you just refit and reuse so that, I mean, and that's the whole kind of thought process behind kite string and what I'm doing is I'm going to, I'm going to basically hand you the rigs and then the education on how to reuse them so that you can spend your time making great characters and great shapes and not have to spend the time wondering why your IK doesn't work or how you need to make a, corn, a mouth corner rig or any of those things. It doesn't mean I'm not going to teach it, but in my time at Pixar, I spent 95% of my time making shapes, not making rigs. And this is something I think people on the outside don't get to experience because it's such a big task to build the rigs. And this is why Lukash's stuff with ACS is so powerful because they can focus on making shapes and animating characters and less on the technology. It's the same thing I'm trying to do. 
So before we go here, Michael, um, any, so I guess somebody just asked 13.2. Did we mention this in the release date is, or you don't have it quite down yet? Uh, I don't have that on hand. It is uh, imminent. imminent. <laughs> so soon, soon, but um, yeah, there's still time to hop in the beta and we're still look, we're, we're looking for people to bang on it and uh, give us feedback and uh, all that great stuff. So hop in there and um, yeah, it'll, it should be pretty soon. I, I, I didn't bring, I didn't uh, take note of the release date. Yeah, so if you jump on the beta, there's some threats there. They're at a bug fixing stage, so I think, I think it'll be out pretty quick. If you're not on the beta, or you, you don't have to be on the beta, you just have to be on maintenance or a subscriber, and you're yeah. If you're if you're a subscriber, then you you can go right, you know, download the beta, try it out, uh, get on the forum, and uh, you know, exactly. tell us what you think. Um, you know, Matt Mearsbergen, who who's done some of the best uh, character work I've ever seen coming out of Moto has done a series of fantastic commercials um, with talking animals and all kinds of stuff that I honestly cannot believe that a single human would have agreed to uh, take those tasks, <laughs> those jobs on. <laughs> I'd love to see your, like, uh, you know, your SOW for that. I'm like, yeah, they'll do everything. Matching cameras? Great. Anyway, um, he uses Character Box a lot, which is a Japanese character animation program for Moodle. Uh, Moodle. Moto. I said Moodle because somebody said Doodle here in the in the in the, uh, it's the rig in the chat, thing. rig doodle, but I like Moodle, Moodles, Moto Moodle. Doodles. Okay. Um, Moodle. Anyway, there's a, another character box uh, update coming out soon, so that's um, I'm not sure what their sort of uh, trial is over there, but they've got all kinds. I mean, character boxes are just again, it's super cool, and it'll benefit from all these other um, benefits you're seeing in the graph editor and, and the performance and everything else. Sure. Um, but I think I think we're hitting about an hour and a half. I think uh, Friday, almost uh, beer time. We think. Oh, it's beer out. time! Beer time! Get your kite string uh, license. This is the last day for the discount. Come on, baby! Kite string, last day for the discount. Nice so sign up there, kite string, kite kite string dot com. Correct. Kite string online dot com. Kite string online dot. Okay, and then we'll put a link uh, somewhere for that as well. Um, I would shout out to Ryan Drew. I had Ryan uh, lunch with Ryan Drew yesterday. If you don't remember, back in the Luxology days, Ryan Drew was sort of the built-in in-house artist. Um, then he went on to ILM, and uh, now he's at Apple just down the road from me here. So we uh, met for lunch yesterday. It's really nice to see him again. So small world, small community. Um, but shout out to Ryan, who's probably not watching this, but that's fine. <laughs> um, all right, guys. So, uh, yeah, we'll uh, put out the word next time. Uh, do you, uh, Michael, are we doing rendering next or modeling? You know, I think we're doing rendering next. I think we're going to have uh, – hopefully we'll get Alan in. We'll be taking a look at the Path Racer. Um, and, yeah, that's going to be really cool. Um, I think we're looking at some time next week, but uh, but stay tuned for the exact time and date. All right. So rendering next week, and we will rope Alan in. We will rope him in. We'll get him in here. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I am going to stop the stream now. I All think. right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. See you, Rich. See you.